Well, thank you, George, for chatting with me today. Well, thank you for having me. You are here in Monterey, California for the International Society for Seed Science Triennial Conference. And your research program, uh, I'm going to take a deep breath here, seeks to understand the relationship between molecular and cellular complexity using multicellular plants as a model system of study. We'll get to that in a minute. Uh, first, can you tell me a little bit about yourself and uh, why you're here in Monterey for this particular conference? Yeah, sure thing. So I started uh, my scientific journey in seeds. I did my PhD in Canada with Derek Bewley, and I studied uh, signaling pathways controlling the germination of tomato seeds. And that was in Guelph in Canada. And since then, I've just continued to work in science uh, with seeds in different capacities. And this being the premier seed germination and dormancy meeting, the triennial meeting at the ISSS, I'm here to interact with my colleagues and share uh, the work going on in my lab. Now, as I alluded to in my first question, you're doing some very innovative research using 3D mapping of individual cells in the seed embryo and determining how plant hormones interact across specific regions to control germination. Now, you're interested in understanding the molecular components and interactions which underlie a seed's decision-making process. Now, that is totally fascinating to me, this idea of a seed being able to make decisions. Can you shed some light on this for me? How does a seed make decisions? And, and in layman's terms, what exactly are you looking at here? So I mean, plants, they make decisions much the same way animals do, in that there are points in their life cycle, in the case of plants, or even in our day as humans, where we need to make a decision to yes or no to do things. For example, a uh, decision to, to eat food, uh, the decision to come to this meeting. These are all either or decisions, and they're made through a complex process whereby we receive multiple pieces of information, and in our brains, we integrate that information to come up with a yes or no decision. So there's lots of examples of these across the whole uh, tree of life. Seeds and plants are no exception to decision making. They'll make one of two major decisions in their life cycle. One is when to commence flowering, when to start reproduction. And the other one is when to terminate the dormancy of their seeds, which leads to the establishment of a plant. So what we are interested in looking at is how it is that the seeds are using information from the environment to optimize the time timing and positioning with which they terminate dormancy. And that's, this is really important because seeds are the way that plants move through space so they can move from here to over there, but they as well move through time. So seeds are space-time travelers and the way that they exit and enter these dimensional times, uh, this, this, this dimensional twist of time is through dormancy. So what we're interested in knowing is how the seeds are optimizing that decision, when to stop being a seed, when to start being a plant. Now, of course, a seed is a much more stress-tolerant and robust structure than a plant is, which requires constant source of water, etc. So, um, especially a seedling is very vulnerable to the environment. So, getting that decision well-timed is critical to the survival of a given plant. Now, I want you to picture a consumer in the grocery store walking down the aisle shopping for food. What could your research ultimately one day possibly mean for that person? Well, it's an, it's an excellent question. So all the food that the people are buying are principally derived from the planting of a seed, and in most cases, they are directly eating seeds, be it uh, their cereal, their bread. Uh, most food, 70% of the world's calories are coming directly from seeds, less so in the Western civilization where we have a more varied diet. So what does it mean? It, it means that the amount of input that went into the creation of that food is going to be less. So there will be uh, greater yield, you can say, greater use efficiency of the land. So we can think in a theoretical sense that perhaps prices could go down if production were to be increased in a more efficient way. But at the same time, we're being challenged by climate change. So we have these unpredictable weather patterns which are impacting yield, they're impacting crop production. So we're going to see, and we've begun to see, for example, I live in the UK at the moment, I think there was a shortage of broccoli and this was due to there being a late frost. I believe in the United States this year there's a very small peach harvest, again because of a late frost and all the 
of flowers got frozen and didn't lead to uh, pollination events. So the consumers would be interested in understanding this from the perspective of when they go to the supermarket and one year there's no peaches in the supermarket and they wonder, hey, what happened? And then they read a news story and they get the backstory as to why there are no peaches. So the type of research we're doing is trying to understand how plants are using information from the environment to time these decisions. And by understanding that, we can hopefully breed crops that are more robust, more resilient to these fluctuations in the environment and not have these kinds of um, food shortages, crop failures, etc. How, how did you get involved with the ISSS and what does uh, an event like this mean for you as a researcher? The IISSS was something my uh, PhD supervisor, Derek Bewley, was very much uh, a founding member of the IISSS, so it was presented to me as a PhD student and I've continued to be with it since. What it means to me, it's, it's a very significant society in my academic career. It was the first society that I was ever a part of and I continued to participate in it. Um, uh, and it was the society that raised me as a scientist, so I very much enjoy coming here and the people are very collegiate, very kind and I think very welcoming to young scientists as well, so it's a good opportunity for people to have uh, the senior academic community give them feedback on their ideas and their work. Thank you very much for your time, George. Thank you, Mark.